Hello everyone. Welcome today to today's meeting. Um, Roman and Dara will be going over uh, joint location and topology. So feel free to take it away, both of you. All right. Yeah. Oh. Well, that's a good way of explaining it. It's just kind of um, explaining like how the model should be made and like the edge loops and stuff like that, so it can deform properly and then joint placement, so then it can move properly. So. I will share my screen in a second. All right, I think we can see the screen now, right? Yeah, yeah, we yep. can. All right, sweet action, let's go. Sweet, so we're going to be talking about topology and joint placement. I'll start us off with topology. So going to like the real basics of topology, just like what is it? Um, it's the flow and arrangement of polygon or faces, whatever you like to call them, vertices and edges in a 3D model. Um, so typically modelers are normally responsible for the topology of a 3D model, but you as a rigger should double check the topology of a character before starting the rig. Um, you're going to be working extensively with the model and how it deforms, so you want to make sure that it's good to go. Um, so basically check if there are areas that could use improvement or if you have any specific preferences to the topology that needs to be added or preferences that would cater to animation. All right. So good topology will probably give you good rigs, but why? Um, topology determines the shape and deformations of a model, which is really important for character animation. So when the topology is organized in a way that's very clean and it makes sense with how the character is supposed to bend and move, the animation will in turn be easier and smoother looking, fluid, just better. Um, and overall, good topology just makes the model easier to work with throughout the rigging process. So it's easier to sculpt corrective shapes, blend shapes, and just you're able to make nice deformations that reflect muscle activity, et cetera, et cetera. In short, it's just an easier time for you as a rigger, and it looks good for animation. So what is good topology? What, what should you be kind of looking for? Generally speaking, um, it differs from model to model, but really you're looking for good edge loops and areas that will deform. So um, typically, you might want to pay attention to like the elbows, the knees, shoulders, um, or eyes, lips, and nose, and the facial areas, just places where it's going to deform a lot, it's going to move. So you want to have good edge loops, good edge flow there. Um, and then, of course, you want the proper amount of polygons or the density of a model. So you don't want anything that's too low poly, but you don't want any, anything that's too like obscenely high poly. And of course, all polygons or faces should be quads, four-sided, no n-gons, no triangles, because um, when you have n-gons, it's gonna like there'll be some pinching. It's not gonna look as good. So you wanna keep like the topology should be all quads. Um, and then of course, it should also be as even sized as possible throughout the model. Of course, there may be exceptions like in face and legs. Uh, it should be even size and it should define the form of um, the model. And additionally, in my opinion, um, a better workflow would be to also have maybe a symmetrical model in posing because, well, if your model has asymmet asymmetry, then it might be better to add that those asymmetrical ports through maybe blend shapes or displacement or just anything on top of the symmetric model because it might be easier to work um, symmetrically as both like whoever's modeling it and whoever's rigging it. So my recommendation, but of course it's, that doesn't mean that it's impossible to work off of an asymmetric model. So examples of topology to kind of get the gist of it. So here's your classic example of like what's bad, what's good on the left. That is definitely the ugliest thing I've seen today. Um, just like bad edge flow, um, super uneven um, polygons, 
not really symmetric, the edge flows don't really support the model, just overall really ugly. I doubt any of you really want to work on something like that. So on the right side, it's this is more even spaced, more um, like squares, square shaped, more even, um, and proper edge loops that um, like the density, there's more higher density around the eyes, mouth, and nose because those are places where it's gonna like move a lot. So you need the edge loops to properly support those areas. Um, yeah. Yep, and you can also see how um, in these like really unorganized uh, topology layouts, um, sometimes things can really easily like really just pinch, and things can get dented. So when something looks like this, you'll often see like these like weird kind of bumps in the uh, model because the um the like the vertices get really pushed together sometimes by these weird workflows. Yes. Um, going to further elaborate on more facial topology stuff. Um, on the left side, you um, modelers need to be mindful of where to put their stalls. They're like like the place where five lines will like intersect at one point. Um, you'll have a couple stalls throughout the face. But essentially, on the incorrect example, having that stall there kind of breaks that edge, that edge flow, that like the way the faces um, are laid out. So you want to optimally, um, like the modeler will want to optimally place those in places where it will support deformation. Um, so in the correct example, you'll see more of a clear nasal labia structure. Um, and then on the right side, or other examples, on the top, these are bad examples because even though they're very like nice and even, and you don't really see any end guns, no triangles or anything, they don't support um, really deformations. They don't have proper anatomy structure. They don't circle around the, the lips or the nose. So the bottom examples are more better examples because um, the edge loops and the kind of flow of the topology supports around the nose and the mouth. And then you'd want like um, a few edge loops around the mouth to support the shape and deformation. Yep. And just um you can see if you're still having some issues with seeing like what a um a pole is or a star, it's kind of like look for like a um a pentagon kind of shape where um you know five of these lines will all come into one point. Mm -hmm. And then kind of just an example of like pretty good facial topology on the left side, something more uh realistic. And you can like you can see how they blocked out um, like all their topology and how there's like a clear like eye mask, clear like nasal labia, like where it circles around the nose and mouth. Um, and then even on exaggerated models, you still have those same concepts apply to that too. So seeing like both something more realistic and something more like super stylized, same concepts. You don't need that good, um, like for topology, good knowledge of anatomy and structure. Yep. And once you get the idea of you know how topology should work, you can then you know like in this example, you can really push it to you know get the exact thing that you need. But um, over here, a good way to kind of remember like how the face should look for you know this example is like uh, think of it as in like a um, a three ring setup so when you're like blocking it out you have like your one eye you have your other eye and then you have kind of like your nose and mouth those are like three key rings that you're going to want to um kind of identify and then you can start adding more detail in later on hmm. and then of course i mentioned that you may have personal preferences when it comes to topology um on the top, here are some like a couple ways to go about hand topology. It's kind of on personal preference and also and also the animation needs. So maybe you need something that really um, 
shows where the knuckles are and really shows the like have the polygons support like a knuckle structure or maybe like like three lines around a knuckle just suffices so it really depends on personal preference and animation needs but there are multiple ways to lay out topology as long as it's clean and it supports the form of a model and supports animation and of course for something like more realistic models you might have like elbow and knee caps in topology to support those realistic deformations um cartoony characters can be even simpler than that like um as long as there's edge loops to support those deformations. So maybe like, I don't know, having like three edge loops to indicate that that's the knee, like something like that. Yep. And so um, going back to some of these examples with like realistic deformations and for example, the, um, the knee here, um, what's really nice about the uh, proper topology is even before you go into skin weighting, like if you were to just attach the, um, like just bind the skin to the joint, you'd immediately see a really good reaction with that uh, topology. So like before you even skin weight, you can see that it looks pretty realistic already. And so then it's just minor tweaks after that. Mm -hmm. And to kind of sum up what I just talked about in terms of the basics of topology, um, again, topology is the arrangement of these faces, edges, and vertices on a model. So good topology allows for better rigs as well as better animation. Um, it determines the shape and deformations of the character. So you do want to check your topology of the model before starting a rig. And you want to make sure that it's clean, you're able to work with it, and it's what the animators need. Number one thing is that you always got to check with the animators to see what they need. And to kind of bridge way to the next segment, topology will affect joint placement. Yep. Um, and just like the uh, this example where um, you know, like a joint would be placed here, it really just makes it faster in general. But um, yeah, so going to joint placement, um, it's basically the process of creating a animation skeleton for a rig and understanding the movement is key to the placement of like all the joints. And so there's a lot of place where movement can exist at a model. So you're going to want to check in, like, what does the model need? So it's like, go to the animator and say, like, hey, you know, where does this need to move? You know, how should it move? Questions like that. And so, um, you know, when you're going over creatures, an understanding of anatomy is really important. Um, as you're going to place the skeleton joints, basically where the real joints would be, too. Um, my joints are also used in areas where there aren't necessarily joints, but there's, like, good muscle movement, like eyebrows, lips, and the eyes themselves. Um, and in some cases, and you know, this is a lot like with uh, like just rigging props in general, where there isn't even movement, there can be a joint um, placed there because it's got to provide like a pivot point or, you know, say you have like a door handle, it just needs to twist at this one part. And so understanding the anatomy of placing joints. So whenever you're um, placing joints in a skeleton, you always got to, you know, put it inside the mesh, not anywhere outside of it. But um, you know, let's say, for example, let's take the hand. So if you look at your hand and you kind of like bend your fingers, you can immediately spot the obvious joints. And so some things are like, you know, your pointer finger, knuckle, and then saying like for like your arms and stuff, you can see your shoulders, your ankles. But um, in order to get realistic movement, you also got to know where there's other joints and like where there's other like movement that we don't immediately recognize. So um, a good example that you can like really see like right now is in uh, your thumb so um look at your thumb specifically and kind of like look at your palm so bend your thumb kind of inwards and you can see that um you know it doesn't just bend at like the uh, kind of like knuckle area it also bends from the inside of the palm itself and you can see in this model that i have uh, two examples so this one the joint starts kind of like right at the uh, the knuckle and then over here, the joint starts kind of like more so in the palm. And so one thing that you can try and do is you can hold that uh, joint in your palm and then bend your thumb. And you're going to see it doesn't really look right. If you're like creating a fist, you can't really get that like, you know, that closed thumb look. You're going to have it always just kind of jutting out. And so, um, you know, then, you know, that's just like one example of the hand. But there's a lot of other things like for, um, you know, the arms. 
you know, there's like a clavicle muscle where it's kind of like, you know, your shoulder isn't doing all the movement and stuff like that. There's a lot of that. And so it's really good if like for whatever you're doing, just getting a basic idea of like the movement of everything and just kind of like watching just like a walk cycle of like a realistic kind of thing. And then kind of going like, okay, well, that's how that moves. And if you have an example, like a dog, then you can just kind of, you know, message your dog and says like, how do you move your paw? Um, and so then understanding other kinds of movement, like muscle movement. So for places with no real joints, but they can still move, we put joints there anyways, because they, you know, the joints provide the movement. And so, um, Obviously, this is, you know, just one way to do a, a facial rig. Um, but if, so in this example, you can see those joints kind of on the uh, eyelids. Now, obviously, we don't really have, you know, ball and socket joints on the eyelids, but they still provide a, um, you know, like an origin of movement for the uh, the animator. And so what they're also useful for is just, um, you know, for like skin weighting. So then like, you know, your joints right here, then that means that the uh, skin right here will move it, you know, with that joint. And so then you can get like detailed, you know, say, you know, for the eyebrow, they kind of want to do like a more, um, you know, just kind of like surprised or angry expression. You can get those really nice deformations. And obviously, you know, there's different ways to do facial rigs, but I'm just kind of using this as an example. Um, and then if, because if you only have like one joint placed, you know, on the neck, and if you're doing like a really joint based um, facial system, then, you know, you wouldn't really get any movement on the face. And so then um, I also want to go to pivot points. So even where there's not really like, you know, a bunch of like movement right there, we can also have points just for um, for pivots. So um, the this is a, um, a reverse foot rig setup. And they're really nice because, um, you know, say, we need it basically gives the um the foot all kinds of movement that we like really need and it gives really good um pivot points for the foot so um and you as you can see in this where the arrows are kind of pointing it shows the directions of like which joint will affect which joint so you got your um your ankle joint right and then this if you twist this it's going to affect the heel joint and so the heel will affect that joint all right but then what's really cool is that from this toe joint, if you were to rotate this, it would kind of like follow with the, um, the ankle would follow through with it. And I could show an um, example of that in a demo in a second, but it's really useful because, you know, this joint isn't going to really like wiggle around or anything. It's used for pivoting though. And um, yeah, that's really good. And so, yeah, that just about covers the, um, the boring lecture. Are there any questions, or have we confused everyone? Oh, if you have anything you'd like to add to this subject. I have a question kind of about topology. So I've heard the whole uh, all quads thing versus um, obviously end guns, but then triangles. So I've heard like a bunch of different opinions, really. Like, and I just wanted to see if we could set it straight. Like, so I've heard that triangles can be useful for terminating edge loops um, in certain ways. And when the model gets subdivided, everything becomes all quads anyway. And this is for animation, but then also for game design, uh, for game engines, everything becomes triangles anyway. Um, so I, I just wanted to know if um, if it's, you know, there's actually some advantage to using triangles in some places. Um, yeah. Uh, for games, using triangles are totally fine. Um, it's N-Gons, absolute no on that. But yeah, triangles, they're, they're pretty, yeah, like you've said, they, when you subdivide, it'll become a quad anyways. Just, it's just, it's kind of more like a practice that you try, you might want to keep like subconsciously where you're like, don't like destroy your topology to like get rid of one triangle but so if you're left with like a couple triangles it's fine when you subdivide it just like try to like um keep it as quad as possible it seems like that it seems like uh it depends on the on the on the industry you're working in because game industries like you mentioned they all go to triangles so keeping triangles for like elbow movements when you want to terminate that when you want to essentially like um 
make the edge loop for your uh, elbow using a triangle would possibly would probably benefit um, in certain cases. Whereas mm-hmm. in the film industry, where you know qua- where you have really high resolution mes- meshes, you should not have like a your full res mesh have a triangle on it. That probably just it sounds like it probably wouldn't um, happen through the subdivisions in that case. So it's kind of like it it it. it like you'll probably end up with quads in the end if you're working on a model for a film, but if you're working on a it, working on it for a game, triangles are probably totally fine. Like, yeah. can I oh, can I say cool. something about that? Go right ahead, please. Okay, so, um, in in games, terminating edge loops with triangles is usually a good thing to do, like on the inside of the ears. I mean, you kind of want to avoid it altogether, but like it's fine in some ways, like. Um, if you put a tri- if you, like put a triangle in there, it's gonna like pinch in a certain way. So like, um, where like the fingers meet the palm, if you have like triangles like in between each joint, like it's gonna like pinch, and that's gonna be like a realistic deformation of the palm in a way. Um, at least I saw that in one hand, and I was like, huh, that's interesting. Um, but like insides of the ears inside of the nose, inside of the eye sockets, inside the mouth, like things that aren't going to deform and things that are not going to be like seen. Like that's where you want to have your triangles at really. And bottoms of the feet too. Cool. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's where it's like, um, you know, it's like, yeah, like a lot of like visibility, like what's going to um, be seen. Um, you're still going to want to, you know, maybe try to avoid stuff. And, um, but I mean, if you can, then, you know, then I guess in whatever you're working, you can always uh, talk to them. But, um, you know, one other way that you can kind of use a, a triangle to, um, and something is if you look up here, there's, um, there's these two triangles kind of like right at the uh, edge of the eyebrows on the uh, inside, but they're technically not triangles. They're uh, they're quads. They're sh- just kind of shaped like triangles. Um, to kind of end, you know, this one loop kind of going up. But, um, yeah, I can still understand, you know, using triangles occasionally just for, like, you know, proper movement, or if it's not going to be seen, then you can just kind of do that. Yeah, yeah, I, I usually try to be, like, pretty OCD about all quads, and sometimes... Mm-hmm. Me too. <laughs> like, yeah, especially, like, in the ears, and, like, sometimes I just end up, like, especially doing manual retopology, it's just... No matter how many t- ways I try to close it, there's always going to be one odd edge, so it just ends up being a triangle. So, yeah, yep. make sense. Just try to hide it. Yeah, and keeping quads is also good for, um, you know, if you do need to eventually like go back in and you know like remodel some parts. Um, I feel like opening up a triangle would be a little bit tougher. Um, just kind of like trying to reduce some parts. A quad might be easier because it can just kind of like an edge can just easily go throughout the entire thing. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yep. Uh, are there any other questions that anybody had? I don't know. Well, I'm going to pull up the um, a rig that SCAD actually gives out to kind of show an example of the... Um... Uh, reverse foot? Yeah, the reverse foot. Because okay. that is like one of my favorite things. I love reverse foot. I remember like when I first like rigged it, it was just like, holy crap, this is so cool. Because it's like before, um, I usually just ended my uh, kind of like feet, like after like the ankle, I just kind of like go to the toes and like that would be it. But um, reverse foots are like a quick sort of quick thing to do and they can really make it just look so much better are you sharing your screen or your window right now uh i'm opening up maya right now but i'll share um, my window in a second <clears throat> gotcha and uh you'll notice that there's like a lot of things like this where there's like movement where um you don't really like think of it as movement so make sure that um you know if you're going to model or if you want to like start to rig something you really get the idea of like where does something kind of move just really study the anatomy of it 
Yeah. Oh, can you go to the the topology sheet with the um the hands? Yeah. The face yeah. sides back up. Um, the the top right one. So you see how it's got like the edge loops that go around the knuckles, and then it kind of like um they like terminate the edge loops with like the diamond shaped quad at the base of the hand. Like, yeah. A little, bit, a little bit further down. When you go to subdivide that, it um basically creates like the tendons in the hand for you just like from the wireframe alone so like it, it's like one of those things where like just having good topology can kind of act as like a pseudo normal map in a way yeah yeah but like, like before having... you even have to uh, do skin weight it already starts to, like look as it should mm -hmm. and like having like loops around the elbows too and knees yep yeah stuff's cool all right, I'm going to change my screen to my Maya screen. Yeah, and yeah, good topology looks really nice too. I like it a lot. Feels so satisfying to get it done. But yeah, so if we look at this um this foot here, um for this rig, I don't really know where the, the joints and all that are. Um because I haven't really opened it up completely, but this is one that uh, we get for our animation class. Um, is it loaded can... on everyone's screen? Yeah. OK. It's just me. But you can kind of see here, if we look back at the, um, uh, I got to share my whole screen if I'm going to be transitioning a whole bunch. If we look at the reverse foot setup, we can see how you know, in this again, there's like your ankle goes to your heel and that controls your toe. And then from there, your toe can kind of um, mess with, you know, it'll if when the toe rotates, um, the ankle will kind of pivot off of that. So if we go back, you can see over here, if we do kind of a um, foot tilt, oh, whoop, wrong one. that's kind of like the uh, ankle right there. That's also the... Um, you know, like that joint is kind of like placed right in the middle there. Let's see, I haven't messed with this one too much, but you can see here how whenever I move just the toe, everything else comes up. And so then the toe, it's pivoting. So you're not like, you don't have to worry about having to like, you know, keep keying it, you know, to kind of like keep it at the same spot. It works really well just to keep it still in place. Um, but yeah, then you have, you know, your other controls for, you know, moving around. So you'll have, you know, your kind of heel pivot right there too. So whenever, you know, there's like a hardcore kind of heel crunch, you can do that as well. And then even for, um, you know, just tilting it side to side, you can also have that kind of movement too. And so I've seen um, it used where it's like th some people have joints that go to the side, but some people also just have um, like groups that kind of go there. So sometimes you need joints, but, you know, you can just it depends on how you want to rig it. There's a lot of different ways that um, you can do these sort of things. Um, and then like in here, you have your like your ball joint kind of at like the, um, the base of your toes. So those will do well for, um, you know, moving just the toes itself, or whoops. And then, ah, just moving the ankle without moving the toes. And then, yeah, you can also just sew things around on that joint too. But yeah, so that's kind of like a, um, a reverse foot setup. Does anyone want to see like a different example of anything, or uh, is that just about it? That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of um, just like things that underlying things that you don't see that can make it really work well for AI rig. And then it's your job to fix it when it breaks. <laughs> True.
<clears throat> it's like how do how do rigs break exactly? Um, well, rig can break kind of. I, I bet Brandon can say a lot more from from more experience, but um, yeah, I'd say if things aren't zeroed out correctly, um, you know, sometimes you can have like, especially if you're trying to do like a um like an IK setup where um you know your knee needs to bend in a certain way. Sometimes it just like won't bend a certain way so we have you know this knee controller um but sometimes if the rig is kind of broken the knee will kind of be going like this way and all that sort of stuff when um obviously it should be going this way so you just set constraints then right um at that point it's just problem solving to find out what to do in order to uh, fix it because um you know, yeah, yeah, it can be a constraint to fixes, but then sometimes you have to like go in and like um tell the you know the joint like where to specifically like look. Mm. In an example, um, it also works for you know, like a spine kind of rig. I can pull up a um another thing that I was working on, where I can show that off sort of. Another case where like you can have your rig break is where you're doing a very repetitive process where it's like, um, and you're not necessarily using Python to do it. It's like a case where you're like, okay, I need to do this one thing like a plethora of times and you just end up, um, you will probably, and like uh, a good example, um, when I'm, I have to do a, I had to do like a face rig that I used ribbons for and I needed to connect attributes of one thing to another thing multiple times and the problem came when i accidentally had like one thing that i didn't want to control when i had the thing that was going to be controlled controlling the controller so it was a complete inverse of what i wanted to happen and that basically broke it so it comes in a, it often comes in a case where you're like repeating a process so many times that you just kind of accidentally flip-flop the order of operations on things and you just need to <laughs> And that's pretty much, and that's like the major source of the problems that I accidentally make that I just can't, uh, that takes me a long while to fix because it's just a case where it's like, um, you made a mistake without realizing it and you, and it takes, and it's in an area where it takes a fair amount of like digging to figure out where the problem exactly is coming from. Um, also, uh, personally, because, um, I'm just not very, uh, like a proper, I didn't really I'm not really properly educated on joint orientations and how to properly manage them very well. Um, in IK splines, when I have like, when I need to twist something, I find uh, often that my, uh, my, my joints will just destroy each other, destroy each other's joint orientations and like cause a bunch of flipping because I didn't set up the uh, IK handle properly. So it's just fine. It's, it, that one's a bit easier because it's just, going in and um swapping around a few numbers so it they can be very small things like the value of one attribute to to completely flip-flopping how you how you set up controllers and stuff it, it's it they can be very they could be incredibly varied in how they function in terms of breaking a reg yeah so basically there's a lot of ways that you can do it <laughs> um and in one example Here's a, a paper rig I have. So I have the um, the orientation of all the joints shown. You can see there's like Y is going this way. All I have all the Y is going this way. And so the way I set up this rig is it's like a little paper stack that can um, you know move around, but it can also twist around. Now you can see the um, the Y axis with this since you know I have it all lined up. Whenever it twists, it looks proper, and you can see. Um, I go to just the joints, you can see the Y kind of goes in that spiral shape. Now, say if um, you know, that wasn't working correctly, like if I had, um, because the way that I did it is I have it kind of like a, um, you know, like for the IK solver, I have it going to the advanced twist controls. If I have like just one number wrong, it's going to look like that. Everything's going to be all flipped. So yeah, like what Brandon was saying is just like sometimes it just takes changing, like just adding a minus sign to fix kind of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the infuriating part is it's like sometimes like something could be like so broken and like you don't know how to fix it, but it's just like one small thing. It's just like ah, I wish I knew that earlier. 
I'll... Also, uh, it transforms and inheriting inheriting transforms, like especially on Spline I think, oh, God. when you want to scale your rig. That's the most frustrating one for me. Oh, yeah. The worst is when you're like done and then you forgot to turn that off for like a curve. <laughs> and in the case of like the yeah. like animator or whoever is using the rig, um, possibly breaking it, it's also pro it's fa a fair amount of the times it's not really on the animators, it's on the riggers, kind of just not. Well, at least that's how I think about it. It's on me for not making it very clear how to use this. Um, because uh, a lot of the times breaking in rigs comes in the form of animators setting keys on things that should not have keys set on them. Because you'll have things with constraints on them, and the second, if you if you don't lock and hide those attributes, your rig will be broken the second that the animator keys it. So locking and hiding attributes that shouldn't be used are key to keeping your rigs f safe to use in the, in the hands of an animator. <laughs> Because, like, uh, I remember um, one of uh, the professors mentioned, yeah, you need to make sure that everything in your hierarchy that needs, that can be locked, um, that, well, that needs to be locked is locked and hidden. Because when an animator is um, is working on the controls, they're not, like, select, uh, very few times that where they're working with a hierarchy. Like, if they're working on an arm at the time, chances are they won't be uh, only clicking on the controls in the like viewport they'll be like up and down arrowing through the hierarchies so if they you'll be going through a bunch of offset groups and if you set a key on those things nice job the arm rig is now busted and you have to and it's either it just becomes super confusing because chances are they uh you're just in such a zone you're in such you're in the zone so hard that you don't realize you set a key on something you should have set a key on and it just something just broke on you you don't know why Okay, so um, really quick question. So from a, a modeler's perspective, um, i.e. mine, um, for retopology, um, w when you say like a rig gets broken, is that like typically like on the rigger's part or like I know that there's like broken topology, but like um, a, a rig can still like break super easily even if the topology is perfect, right? Oh yeah, like. At that, oh, yeah, yeah. at that point, it's more or less down to, like, how the rigger handles the geometry and stuff. Uh, I think one of the, um, my weak points is, like, uh, scaling objects. Like, adding, like, scale constraints can just, like, totally screw things up. Like, this, this book, while it's, like, it looks really simple, it took me ages to figure out, like, how to actually do it. And, uh, it's a, it's a process. Oh, um... In your guys' personal preference, like what's what's more difficult, rigging organic things or rigging hard surface things? Organic takes longer. Yeah, I'd say that. Hard surface takes longer. No, no, no. Organic stuff takes longer. Oh, because you gotta like. If you do robots, you just constrain. Yeah, you, know? you just okay. constrain yeah. and do whatever. And cool. skin weights yeah. take a lot less time too. Um. Also, do you need UVs for rigs? I'm curious. Yes. Okay. The follicles. Okay. I thought so. Right. In this example, um, what I did, because I was trying to, um, I used a ribbon rig to get the uh, page deformation, but scaling it would always prove like an issue. So I had to kind of like do this weird kind of blend shape kind of technique where basically this stays invisible. Um, and it's kind of like, this is just a duplicate, but it follows all of the uh, steps of that. It's just the only difference is this version can actually scale. So the other thing just doesn't follow any of the movements except for like a, you know, the page where it needs to deform and stuff like that. Mm. And that's where the um, a lot of the like inherit transform issues can come in. But uh, yeah, so 
that's my little example of I, I think I can actually pull up when that rig wasn't working. And that was a... Uh, I hated that. Okay, so I have a quick question um, regarding, like, characters that have multiple UV maps. So, like, they have, like, one for the body, one for the clothes, and then, like, one for, like, hair, and then, like, teeth and eyes, and then, like, other, like, ornamental stuff, like, on their body. So say a character has, like, 10 UV maps total or something, um, you could still like rig the whole thing and have it be perfectly fine. Uh. So earlier on, when I was doing this rig, one of the issues that um I had a lot was whenever I would try, like whenever this controller would scale just for a page, mm -hmm. it would do this weird like extendo kind of thingy. And so then it's kind of like um, whenever something doesn't work, you have to identify like what specifically is um, not working. So if I go to show kind of everything that's, you know, showing is basically the uh, the ribbon itself isn't really, um, you know, these like these joints aren't scaling up, but they're scaling in terms of like whenever, you know, this ribbon moves, they just kind of follow it. So that's why, you know, like I have like some different joints placed on the mesh specifically at these corners. But for these that are like attached to just the ribbon, the uh, the joints themselves don't like have any uh, scaling kind of value. So then all they do is just make this weird kind of like they just move, but they don't scale, which makes everything just really long. Um, I believe that... Uh... Adam also will, could, would you be cool with uh, explaining uh, more about like UDIMs and stuff? Because um, I know that you did, well, you some work with UDIMs. Because uh, I do believe that uh, oh. yeah, Adam was more talking about like specifics on UDIMs. I didn't mm -hmm. work like um, specifically, I mean, besides that it was on the model that I was working with, I didn't like have a direct hand in UDIMs. Um, who say I'm gonna be quite honest? That's fair. I just wanted to I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't talking out my ass when I said yeah, then you'll be fine. Because <laughs> I have not worked with um, Udim, so I just wanted to make sure that like uh, yeah, you're. Oh, I wasn't um talking about Udims oh, okay. or like UV sets. I was like each like individual meshes with individual UV maps. Oh, like, then... like a like they like. It only takes up the zero to one UV space, but like it's on different meshes. Okay, then yeah, that's they have their own unique zero one UV maps. Then yeah, you're you're totally good. You should be fine with that. Okay. Yeah, you're good. All right. Well, does that cover just about all the questions, or does anyone else have any um any other questions about broken rigs and how to manage your temper when something doesn't scale right and you spend an hour trying to fix it. <laughs> Do you guys know about the 2020 um, constraint system? The transform system that they're changing? Like the parent offset matrix stuff they added? Yeah, uh, I've seen yeah. That. that term thrown around so much. Oh yeah, I, I don't know what it I is, have so. seen that. I've wanted to explore it. I'm pretty sure Mason can tell a lot about that. I've only stuck to constraints and offset groups because that is the way that I w was taught on it. And I know a lot of people who haven't even switched from like Maya 2018 yet. So like until it becomes like a few versions, that's in, me. I'm just gonna stick to like uh, the old system but learn the new. That's just my personal preference on it. I mean, it's a pain to set up. Yikes. So, yeah. It's not, it's not a click of the button. You have to go in the node editor and drag yeah. shit. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Mason, if you have anything you'd like to uh, talk about on that. Yeah. Um, I I actually also haven't switched over to 2020 because 2018 works perfectly fine and 2020 can be buggy. Yeah. But um, the Matrix stuff is super, 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 super cool um, because a lot of, like, Industry rigs don't use constraints. They use matrices because they evaluate a little tiny, teeny bit faster. Um, and so you can go in and you use, they have like a malt matrix node and then the decompose matrix and there's a bunch of other ones. 
But like those are the main things that you use. And it's all about like multiplying and dividing and like adding transforms of objects um, to make constraints. And so before you have all of these nodes, and that's what I have in my rigs is like tons of nodes. And now it's just simpler. So they have like operations that you do a lot built into the nodes. Um, if that makes any sense at all. Plus, it also gives rise yeah, to like that. Look into it that. gives rise to one of the most beautiful yeah. things ever, which is just a single hierarchy of controls. Yeah, it's very, very cool. We can call, I have to make the transition at some point, I guess. <laughs> That'll be under me, because I'm going to be here for a while. What year are you? Uh, I'm a sophomore still. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I got into rigging stuff like way in high school. And I, That's cool. <laughs> all self-taught stuff so it was always broken, but I always had fun with it. I was a like, big <laughs> stupid smile on my face when I got like the foot to not twist like crazy. <laughs> yeah, I wish that I had access and like, well, I did have access and the knowledge, but I just didn't like have the like drive to do it in high school, I guess. I still have my uh, my first rig that I did, and each year, like I go back to it, and it looks worse and worse. But I love it. 